Venture is part investment, part psychology. It's exposure to the new, new thing. It has an excitability element, but sometimes has a frustrating patience element. Five years becomes seven years, becomes 12 to 20 years. Institutions are used to such long range time horizons, but people often have shorter attention spans. Even multi-generational families sometimes have less patience, especially when they are not directly running the business. Because our clients are taxable, we have a preference for early stage venture, but one can take advantage of QSBS, the Qualified Small Business Stock Tax Benefits. That saves 25% now because capital gains tax federal is 25%. But if you believe that taxes will go up with our ballooning debt, then you know maybe down the road, QSBS saves you 35 or 45% in taxes when those gains are realized. What leads you to want to do deep diligence on a manager? Across all our private asset classes, I look for three things. You know, we want a manager that is smart because we don't want dummies. We want someone that has a niche or specialty that is distinct from others. And three, we want someone with systems and processes already in place so that they are not figuring out how to set up and run a fund on our money or our client's money. Venture capital is known as an access class, whereas the top GPs oftentimes pick the top LPs. How do you gain access to the top venture capital GPs? Michael Ashley Shulman, I've been looking forward to having this conversation. Welcome to the 10X Capital Podcast. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for bringing me on. A pleasure to have you. Uh, so, Michael, you're the CIO of Running Point Capital Advisors. What is Running Point Capital Advisors? Um, simply, Running Point is a multifamily office. We tailor financial and investment approach for our clients and families. In other words, David, we can run point on all things financial for our families. So for a family office that doesn't have near-term liquidity needs, how do you advise them to allocate between private and public investments? Often we like to initially guide 20 to 40% of their investment portfolio into privates for most of our families, which means 60 to 80% will be in publics and relatively liquid. And down the road, we can reevaluate as things change. You know, for us, private investments include private real estate, private credit, venture capital, private equity, secondaries, hedge funds, uh, other esoteric investments. And some of the private investments like private credit and real estate, yes, they're private. Yes, you're locked into it for maybe five years, seven years, 10 years, but they're cash flowing. So even though they are technically illiquid, you know, meaning that they're hard to sell, they can create income that will flow back to you and your portfolio. Income that can be used to meet cash needs or be reinvested into other areas. Well, why not have 60, 80% of your money in privates? Let's say that you don't have any short-term liquidity needs, or maybe you don't even have liquidity needs in the next decade. Why, why would you have such a small amount in privates? Love that question. I get that question a lot from institutions, because a lot of institutions have less in the publics and more in the privates. There are several answers to that question. We look at our family's big picture. So many of our families still run their own business or are starting another business. We manage their investable assets while assisting them across their entire financial landscape. They may still have a large part of their wealth tied up in their illiquid assets, including their home, second home, third home, a yacht, and especially in their own business. So when we look at their entire financial picture, of assets, liabilities, legacy, so while 20 to 40% of their investment portfolio may be in privates, 60 to 80% of their total wealth maybe in illiquid assets. So we look at the whole picture. I mean, there's many large differences between families and institutions, but that's one of them. So tell me about your venture capital strategy. Venture is part investment, part psychology. It's exposure to the new, new thing. And it has an excitability element, but sometimes has a frustrating patience element. Five years becomes seven years, becomes 12 to 20 years. Institutions are used to such long range time horizons, but people often have shorter attention spans. Even multi-generational families sometimes have less patience, especially when they are not directly running the business. I was speaking to Andy Golden, who's retiring as CIO of Printco. He was there for 29 years. And he said that DPI is the most overrated thing in the market right now in the VC ecosystem. What do you think about that? <clears throat> Um, I think had to cough. <laughs> yeah, um, I think IR can be overrated. I like Moik, multiple on invested capital. Why? Why Moik over IR? Uh, let's say I look at an investment and it says, "Geez, we can get you sixteen percent IRR or better," and I'm like, "That's great return." But it's a capital call drawdown fund. I make a million dollar commitment. It calls that money over four years, then starts giving me the money back. I'm never fully invested. So the GP, the manager played around to get that IRR. Maybe they used a credit line to make the investment before they did the capital call. There's lots of you know mathematical tricks they can do to boost IRR. And hey, if I'm an investor, that's great. But if maybe if I can put it, make a million dollar investment, but fully fund up front, and I only get a 12% IRR, 
over five, 10 years, my Moik, my remote fund invested capital is going to be much better because I'm fully invested. And million dollars working literally at 12% annualized. What's the best of breed for family offices that have committed capital in terms of how they carry that capital until it's called? A number of different strategies. The best thing is to communicate with a manager, to have an idea of when those capital calls will come in. As I mentioned, we try to create diversification so that we're not short on cash flow. So some of our private or liquid investments like real estate, like private credit, even some secondary funds, they will spit off realizations or income. And then we can use that to fund other capital calls. Also, normally, if we are in a real cash crunch, we can sell something quickly, use T-bills, or maybe go on margin for a week until we can raise the cash. So there's many little levers we can use and pull to fund a capital call and try to stay um, fully invested or as fully invested as possible. But overall, you know, right now with T-bills paying 5.3%, a little liquidity there, plus some stocks, plus other diversified investments can help. The best thing is really to communicate with managers and have line of sight as to when those capital calls will happen or when they've stopped doing capital calls. You know, it's unrealistic that they'll do any more. Do you have some kind of liquidity project management software that outlines when you expect different capital calls to happen? Or how do you manage that? We manage it with software that tracks liabilities. You know, we can track all liabilities and it's, it's financing software. So mortgage payments, paying off, you know, a loan finally, factoring in children's college educations. If the client owns a yacht, the salaries for the employees on the yacht, we factor in all the liabilities and capital calls are part of that. You know, of course, over time, there's going to be adjustments. So if a capital call comes later than expected or earlier than expected, we'll shift things. But yeah, there, there's financial planning software for that. We're not using something specifically for capital calls. It's just generally for the family's balance sheet. Venture capital is known as an access class, whereas the top GPs oftentimes pick the top LPs. How do you gain access to the top venture capital GPs? I like to play on words there, access class rather than asset class. Several ways. First, it depends on how you define top funds. We have a preference for early stage. What helps is knowledge of the asset class and you know finding stuff through our networks. So you know, how do you define top funds? I've happily listened to like many of your prior allocators on your show. They're great, their logic is sound. But every LP has their niche. And quite a few LPs need to invest a minimum of $50 to $100 million per fund. That really narrows their field of possible investments you know, to your largest funds. Also, a bunch of them work for tax-exempt entities like pension funds, government entities, nonprofits. So taxes are not an issue for them. Taxes are always an issue for our clients. And my apprehension with some of those top call funds is that they are late stage and pile money into their own previous deals to sustain them and lessen or delay write-offs. I think a bunch of the large funds are hoping for interest rates or the IPO market to save them. And that's not why I invest in venture. Because our clients are taxable, we have a preference for early stage venture, where one can take advantage of QSBS, the Qualified Small Business Stock Tax Benefits. That saves 25% now because capital gains tax federal is 25%. But if you believe that taxes will go up with our ballooning debt, then you know maybe down the road, QSBS saves you 35 or 45% in taxes when those gains are realized, which as said before, it can be 10, 15 years from now. You know, QSBS can protect up to 10 times an investor's investment from long-term capital gains. That's valuable. We try to focus on the early stage. I guess some GPs also appreciate that we understand their asset class and that they don't have to explain it to us. So they're willing to reach out to us, talk to us. And occasionally some GPs want access to our families to advise, guide, or coach their companies. How do you build a relationship with GPs without investing in a fund? Meet with them, talk to them. So meet with them, maybe gain access uh, through our networks, including our client families. They know a lot of them, peers, other family offices, MIT alumni, and especially other VCs. So that's a way for us to meet with them, meet their LPs at events they hold. Uh, looking at their co-investments is a great way to get inside the head of a GP and see whether they are saying what they do and doing what they say. Is it really a great investment or are they just in love with their own cooking? You track hundreds of funds. How often, LPs oftentimes say that th this kind of magical thing, do you, do you do what you say you're going to do? What percentage of funds on average, not ones that you invest in, but on average, do what they say they're going to do? Is it 25%? Is it 50%? Is it 75%? Directionally speaking, how rare of a trade is it to do what you say you're going to do? Most do. Most really do what they say and say what they do. But I've seen enough cases where they don't. And you're more institutional funds where, you know, you look, it's fund three, fund four, or institutional across private credit, hedge funds and others, they're more likely to st stick and stay in their lane. It's the smaller funds that don't quite have processes or systems in place, or maybe attracted to the new shiny thing 
that might step out of their lane. So you have to decide which funds to really double down on. You're not going to do deep diligence on every single fund. What leads you to want to do deep diligence on a manager? Recommendations from peers and references and some sort of track record or niche and process that makes them look attractive. For many that I talk to, references seem to be a last step in a due diligence process, but where possible, I like to bump it up sooner in the process. Across all asset classes, you know, I look across all our private asset classes, I look for three things. You know, we want a manager that is smart because we don't want dummies. We want someone that has a niche or specialty that is distinct from others. And three, we want someone with systems and processes already in place so that they are not figuring out how to set up and run a fund on our money or our client's money. And that's true across private credit, real estate, hedge funds, and so forth. And I've heard other managers say similar. But for venture capital, I've really added a fourth item to our list in what I look for in a manager. And I look for someone that can choose. I mean, yes, you want a manager that has great access, but I've seen several managers with terrific access make really mediocre investment choices. So I want to know how decisions are made. It's like going to a buffet at the Wynn Hotel in Vegas. Some people walk into the buffet with a strategy and some don't. Some select the good foods and some stomach the cheap stuff. So what drives the GP to say yes versus no to a deal? And what is their track record with that? Do investment decisions need to be unanimous, majority, or independent? Either way is okay, but I really want to know how the GP makes decisions. You mentioned you talked to references earlier. Do you do the references before you dig into the data room, or are you doing it in parallel? Um, I'll look for some things in the data room, but I'll try to, if I can, I'll do it in, in parallel. You know, there's some things in a data room that I really want to see, like investor letters. I'll probably read through a bunch of their investor letters. If they have audited statements, that's great. I may not dive into the audited statements right away, but the investment letters, be they quarterly or monthly, whatever their cadence, tends to share the personality of the GP and their investment case and business case on the various investments over the years. Sometimes you can see if it panned out. If you read investment letters that are five years old, seven years old, three years old, did what they say become true three, five, or seven years later, or did they change topics and subjects? I love reading the the Sequoia YouTube memo. So it was uh, during the YouTube lawsuit, it was a part of discovery. So it's out there. It's an interesting memo. It really played out uh, like Roloff kind of envisioned it, which I think is, is a pretty impressive thing given how nascent the space is. I will look that up. Are you always waiting for this last close and what gets you to accelerate your diligence process? Tell me about some of the signals and some of the game theory around being an LP and investing into a new GP. It's interesting because I, I think we played that a couple of years ago without really calling it game theory. You're right. Normally, it's great if the fund's already 60, 70, 80% invested. You're some of the last money in. You have a look back. There's been gains. But in 2022, 2023, that was the stuff you wanted to avoid. Because anyone that was fully invested or nearly fully invested, you just assume that most of the investments they'd made in 2020, 21, 22 were overpriced. Normally, you want them to be somewhat invested. You want to be last money in. And lately, I've been looking more at funds where I want to be the first money in because there's been quite a correction in 2022, 2023. I mean, not as much as maybe I hoped for, but there's been a correction. So I think this is a better time to invest. And therefore, I want funds that have a lot of cash available to take advantage of the opportunities in the pricing and valuation right now. For GPs that don't have a first close incentive, how would you counsel GPs to get LPs to invest in the first close in today's market? I think part of it is you want previous investors to invest early into your fund, even if you don't have incentives. That shows great continuity and trust amongst your previous LPs. And I think part of it is also just telling a really good story about the opportunities now and being able to show the opportunities that one can take advantage of by investing now, be it pricing or market or technology or searching founders. When do you, as an LP, when do you want your GPs to tell you about their fundraising schedules? If it's a GP that I'm following or care about, I want to heads up as far as possible. Tell me 12 months in advance. Remind me six months in advance. Remind me again three months in advance. Send me some materials. I get an avalanche of emails. So I don't notice everything. I don't see everything. There's managers that know I like them or I care about them or I want to talk to them. They have the right to pick up the phone and call me and cut through the clutter with a phone call. Congratulations, 10X Capital Podcast listeners. We have officially cracked the top 10 rankings in the United States for investing. Please help this podcast continue climbing up in the rankings. 
by clicking the follow button above. This helps our podcast rank higher, which brings more revenue to the show and helps us bring in the very highest quality guests and to produce the very highest quality content. Thank you for your support. What are the benefits and what are the potential risks of investing in spinouts? We try to be selective. Did they spin out from a Lightspeed, NEA, or some other notable top name firm? And did they spin out because they were not going to make partner? Or they weren't moving up the the corporate ladder, so to speak? Or were they the rising star but just wanted to go in a different direction? You need to differentiate between that. I I like a spin out manager, especially if they've been there at least five or 10 years, and they've had time to develop a track record, a real track record, and at least see a few of their investments go full cycle. And that way they can develop a sense of pattern recognition for what can go right and what can go wrong. I get a little bit concerned about some spin out managers that, yeah, they may have made some great investments, but they've not actually seen a company go full cycle. Additionally, when a spin out manager actually has funding from their prior firm or the partners of their prior firm, that's a very positive signal. Love to see that. What are some risk factors that are unique to spin outs? I I think with spin out managers, the, the risks are similar to any new manager, whether they're spin out or not, whether or not they have the systems and processes in place. Was there something about their old firm, be it Lightspeed or A16 or Goldman, that allowed them to be successful, that allowed them to develop a great track record? And now that they are independent, will they have those systems and processes in place? Maybe there was some boss at their old firm that they really disliked, practically hated. But that boss just happened to nix two of their ideas that would have blown up their fund or blown up their strategy or nixed two investments that would have torpedoed everything. So you just don't know what transfers over to their new firm and what doesn't and what saved them at their last firm and may not save them in their new setup. Absolutely. You mentioned systems and processes. What are some best in class systems and processes in the venture space? I, I like to see people that have actually invested money in the past, that have communicated with investors, that understand fiduciary responsibility. You know, there's a lot of brilliant people out there. They were operators. Some of them are good or can be good at running a fund, but some aren't necessarily used to that and used to the fiduciary responsibility. And a lot of them are not used to communicating monthly or quarterly with letters to their investors on what's going on or what's happening with the portfolio. Some are very good at the marketing and the speaking, and some are good at networking with other VCs, but not necessarily with investors. There's a difference. Prior to becoming CIO of Running Point Capital, you spent 14 years and as a manager and RIA called Holland Crest, and also you're a VP at Deutsche Bank. What do you wish you knew before starting as CIO of Running Point Capital? You know, the knowledge has been cumulative. One of my happiest moments at my very first job when I was 21 years old and I was modeling bonds, you know, the pricing was based on the second derivative. And I'm like, I smiled to myself. I'm like, yes, there's a use for calculus. Because when you're in high school- I still haven't found when one. When you're in high school and college <laughs> and you're learning calculus, you're like, when am I ever going to use this? And boom, my first real professional job, 21, I'm using calculus to price bonds. And- What I realized is that a lot of the knowledge is cumulative. Yes, I work in the investment industry. Yes, it's very numbers oriented, but I lean a lot on my writing skills, my creative writing skills to communicate with clients, to talk to reporters, you know, to give up my take on what's going on. Is there anything that I wish I knew? All of it. I'd I'd say the most important thing is to maintain bridges, maintain contacts with people. A lot of us, including me in the investment world, are a little bit of an introvert. And I realize I really like a lot of my peers, I love talking to them, communicating with them, sharing ideas with them. And I just, I need to put myself out there more because it's not my natural tendency to keep up the communication, to keep the lines open, to reach out to them and say hi and talk about family or talk about investments or talk about the economy. And those are often the conversations I enjoy most. Yeah. It's, being an LP is an interesting blend of quantitative and qualitative people skills and heavy quant skills. What would you like our audience to know about you, about Running Point Capital or anything else you'd like to shine a light on? Thank you, David. Um, As you know, by listening to this conversation, we invest across all asset classes and help our families with all things financial under one roof, you know, financial advice, trust and estate planning, tax optimization, family guidance. So want people to just remember that, that we're still growing and selectively adding families as clients. So if anything I said, or, you know, this conversation resonated with you, you know, maybe worthwhile to ask some questions and reach out. But we're based in power. And what's your minimum? It depends. <laughs> Again, that answer, it depends. We like to see a minimum of 
you know, eight to 10 million. But if someone has 2 million of investable assets, but they have their own business, that business is going to have a liquidity event down the road, maybe sold for 20, 30, 40 million. That's actually a perfect client. And you could help them more ahead of liquidity. Events, exactly. Right? What are some things kind of at a high level that people should be thinking about uh, pre-liquidity? What are some tax strategies? Yeah, I like that question. So, you know, we recently met uh, an individual has a family, walked away with 40 million, could have walked away with 48 million. Um, had they just written the sales contract a little bit differently? So the actual M&A deal? The, yeah, yeah, they needed six months longer to qualify for QSBS. So they could have just delayed the purchase, saved a bunch on taxes. Had they moved some of the stock out of California, they could have saved, you know, in advance a couple of years ahead of time, could have saved a lot on state taxes things like that. How is the company incorporated? If you have children or grandchildren and you want to pass on that wealth, maybe you pass it on as a gift in stock before you sell the company. When the 409A valuation is essentially low. Yes, exactly. And that way it doesn't count as much against your individual $13.5 million lifetime gifting exemption. This has been a very illuminating conversation. Uh, thanks for jumping on the podcast and look forward to meeting up in California or New York City very soon. David, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to meeting you in person also. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Bye. Okay. For more ideas on how to raise venture capital in this market, make sure to subscribe below.